Good evening to all of you. And on behalf of uh, Microlabs, we extend a hearty welcome to all of you for this unique hybrid CME program. This program is special for more than one reason. Firstly, this is happening on the eve of World Heart Day. And secondly, this program is live streamed across 53 locations span India, which is a record in itself. We would have close to 150 regional faculty and we also have close to 2,000 plus delegates watching this program. Thank you very much for being a part of this record-breaking event and thanks for gracefully accepting our invitation to be part of this evening's program. Microlabs, as you are aware, we are in the 50th year of our inception. One of the uh, prominent and renowned pharmaceutical houses in the country and uh, this has also been powerhouse of some very very big brands thanks to you brands like dolo 650 brands like arbital brands like hopace brands like amlong i think can go on with the list thank you very much being part of our growth story and we would love to continue our relationship with you and microlabs has always believed in knowledge dissemination in every possible platform and today is no exception and again on the eve of world heart day i am proud to uh, speak about two of our major initiatives which we have launched recently which definitely would have some impact on better control of uh, better management of hypertension the first initiative is called nudge pill which basically is to improve the medication adherence of the patients and second initiative is called salt satyagraha which again is uh, a very huge patient awareness program trying to bring down the dietary salt intake of your patients. I think these two things would really have an impact on better control or better management of hypertension. Right? Today, coming back to this program, we have two world authorities on hypertension, two doctors who are and the doc and a doctor who is moderating the sessions. I think they would need no introduction, but it is still our privilege to introduce them. And I request Dr. Manjula, Senior Vice President, Medical Affairs of Microlabs, to quickly introduce this topic and the speakers and then hand over the session to the speakers. Thank you very much. And Dr. Manjula. Uh, good evening, everyone. And good evening uh, to all the people who have logged in through Zoom, as well as those who are at uh, physically present at 53 locations. Thank you very much uh, for joining in, and thank you all here in Bangalore. And uh, today, the CME topic, as Mr. Shirish already told, renewed focus on uh, beta blockers. And uh, we are very happy that uh, we are having the great uh, speakers or masters with her who are masters in the topic who is going to speak on this occasion. So there will be two sessions, two topics and followed by a summary or take-home message session. The first session is uh, what is missing in hypertension management and what are the lessons from the latest guidelines. Uh, to uh, discuss on this and uh, speak on this, we have none other than the master himself, Professor Dr. Gurpreet Wander, sir. He doesn't need any introduction, but as a, a formality, and it's my privilege to introduce sir. Uh, sir is the principal of uh, DMCH at uh, Ludhiana. He has more than 276 publications to his credit, and he has published in all reputed medical journal, more than 133 of them of international repute, such as Lancet, Nature Genetics, JACC, EHJ, and Heart Journal. He has several awards and accolades, to name very few. He's been the director of uh, Physi Physicians Research Foundation, president of the uh, top professional body of uh, Physician Association of Physician of India, president of Hypertension Society of India. He's been awarded the, the top most award for Dr. Dr. B.C. Roy a National Award in the year 2006. And he's been the associate editor of Jack Asia and JAPI and chief editor of Postgraduate Medicine and Textbook. Dr. Wanda, sir, it's our privilege to have you with us. Welcome to you, sir. The second session is on renewed focus on cardioselective beta blocker in hypertension management. And we have another master, and he's uh, joining us from US. Uh, he's none other than Dr. Michael Weber. Uh, Dr. Weber is preventive cardiologist and hypertension specialist from Downstate College of Medicine, State of University in New York. Uh, Dr. Weber is joining us from US. Uh, he is involved in drug development, uh, beginning with a beta blocker and through contemporary angiotensin receptor blockers. 
is active in all recent clinical trials investigation devices in hypertensive disorders as well as is one of the pioneer in developing ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So Dr. Weber currently serves in the steering committee of several national and the international clinical trials. He's the editor-in-chief of Journal of Clinical Hypertension. He's a member of Executive Committee, International Society of Hypertension. He's the chair, writing committee of Hypertension Clinical Practice Guidelines and Amer American Society of Hypertension. So we have the master with us to discuss and it's our real privilege to have you with us. Welcome Dr. Weber to the program. And. Uh, Another uh, pioneer whom all of you know who is going to moderate this session and give his expert comment is Professor Dr. Venkates Ram, Director, Apollo Institute of Blood Pressure Management, Hyderabad. He has several publications, more than 300 papers and four textbooks to his credit. All these are on hypertension. And Sir has been awarded the prestigious Padma Shri by Government of India. He has got the best award by the University of Hyderabad, best clinician, uh, teacher by St. Paul University at Dallas, Texas. He has the Lifetime Achievement Award by American Society of Hypertension. He has been recognized by all the professional bodies uh, in India, CSI, ISH, and API. So Dr. Professor Esram, warm welcome to you. Thank you for accepting uh, to be the moderator. With this, now I hand over the session to Professor Wander, sir, to make his first deliberation. Over to you, Wander, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manjula, for uh, this uh, elaborate introduction of uh, all of us. And uh, let me uh, share my slides with you. Yeah. So uh, the task assigned to me is to actually uh, build up for the session uh, today. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be talking in a session in which my mentor, Dr. Venkat S. Ram is chairing the session and uh, one of the top uh, researcher in hypertension, Dr. Michael Weber is going to speak. Um, I know Microlabs has worked very hard and there are about 50 places even in Ludhiana, there is one of the peripheral, uh, there, is, uh, there is actually where this live streaming of this session is happening. So coming to the topic, I'll just come to uh, talk about some of the latest guidelines and what the uh, Indian um, population, Indian physicians would learn from them. Of course, we have our own guidelines, which started way back in 2001. And uh, every five to six years, we have been coming with the Indian guidelines. They are all encompassing guidelines endorsed by the IMA, the HSI, API, and the Nephrology Society. It's time for us. Uh, early next year, we will be coming out with our own guidelines. And this is familiar to all of you, the classification of hypertension that we do. Uh, in our country, 140 by 90 is the blood pressure that we call as hypertension, anything more than that. And you keep adding 20 to the systolic and 10 to the diastolic to go up from stage 1 to 2 to 3. Uh, we all know isolated systolic hypertension is more harmful, more difficult to treat, more often in the elderly and needs polytherapy. Uh, this is what Dr. Weber would like to talk about. The American ACC AHA after the JNC disappeared, uh, 2017 uh, guidelines suggested 130 by 80 uh, as a cutoff for hypertension. Uh, all the other societies have not adopted this number, but a big purpose that this number has served is uh, that it has made us aware that in high risk individuals, we need to intervene earlier and this risk concept of hypertension actually stays within our mind because we are not just treating numbers. We are also treating actually uh, the other risk factors and the individual, as we all know, as a good clinician has to be treated in totality. So all the risk factors, the target organ, something that I will talk about in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. We all know Dr. Ram would be knowing more about this actually, but uh, I was a little bit surprised that all the 2013 ESH, ESC guidelines were combined. And uh, last year, the 2023 ESH guidelines came and we thought that these are the guidelines from Europe. But a couple of days back, I was surprised to see this ESC separate guidelines. 
So Dr. Ram does get uh, to review some of these guidelines, but that's not the purpose. Uh, it just, I mean, uh, it shows that we have various guidelines and there are lessons to learn uh, from all these. Uh, of late, guidelines have been talking about pathophysiology and we know besides the renal mechanism and the renin-angiotensin, endothelin uh, system, the sympathetic nervous system Dr. Weber is going to speak on, we now know we talk a lot about genetic factors, behavioral environment has become a big factor, pollution is so common and we know non-communicable disease it is being considered as one of the major risk factors in our country. Uh, socioeconomic factors, psychological. So they all have a role to play. And hypertension etiopathogenesis is now actually for the first time being taken up in guidelines so that as a clinician, you have a holistic kind of view so that you know these lifestyle factors like diet, alcohol, smoking, activities, sleep, environmental, as I spoke, Jared, all these have actually uh, a role to play in the causation of hypertension and we need to hit at all these factors. The first uh, important lesson that we have all received is the recording of blood pressure needs to be respected and we need to spend time on blood pressure recording because if you don't have the correct readings you will obviously be under or over treating patients. So as clinicians it is paramount upon us that we uh, spend time and this picture is familiar to all of you. It's there in various guidelines. Uh, to this August audience, I would not like to go into the detail. But we do know that the mercury sphygmomanometer has now been disposed of. The WHO and even the India is a signatory to the Minimata Convention. And uh, by the next year, we, have, we should have no mercury sphygmomanometers in our country. And today, the device that we most often use is the automatic oscillometric uh, device. The risk devices are to be discouraged and we know that the cuffless, pulseless blood pressure apparatuses haven't yet reached the stage that they can be used uh, clinically. Uh, as I said, the Indian guidelines, uh, you know that since more and more of our people are now recording home blood pressures, keep in mind 135 by 85 would be the cutoff for home. And uh, Dr. Weber is an expert on ambulatory blood pressure. These are the le levels which are given for when you will call hypertensive in ambulatory blood pressure. This is, I just wanted to share with the clinicians across the country. This is a large study of about 18,000 patients, the famous India Heart Study, which did show us that the prevalence of white coat hypertension is 15% and mass hypertension when you're not getting high blood pressure values in the uh, in your clinic, but the pa patient in the home recordings have high. These are unfortunate people who get missed. Otherwise, they have actually, the, the prevalence is about 20% and we need to keep this in mind. We did this work and we published in the Indian Heart Journal. Only one third of our patients are presently, uh, in this I would say we are figuring uh, much worse than the diabetologists who use the home sugar readings much more often. And as clinicians, hypertension, uh, treating physicians, we should encourage our patients to use the home blood pressure and then take a holistic view of the level of the blood pressure rather than one reading. This is a very important concept we need to keep in mind. It's been there for a long time. We know that the risk of an individual, as I said, the American guidelines also highlighted. You can see the high normal pressure that we have in the Indian guidelines. If someone has established cardiovascular disease, or has chronic kidney disease, they are very high risk. So they are worse off than someone who has a blood pressure reading of 180 by 110. Uh, of course, you need to treat all this, but conceptually keep in mind, someone who has multiple risk factors, someone who has hypertension mediated organ damage and established disease, they need to be treated more aggressively. We as Indians know that South Asians in the last, in the 2013 guidelines, the ESC uh, guidelines suggested that any risk has to be multiplied by 1.4 for South Asians because we have the thrifty gene, the syndrome X, central obesity, and our lipid levels and hypertension pattern is different. Um, I've been fortunate. Dr. Ram has been uh, keeping uh, me along with him for some of these works that we have done. And we, in fact, do recognize that we don't have an Indian uh, risk scoring system just as the Europeans have a score system and the Americans have their own system. But what we very simplistically emphasize that the age, 
male sex, lipid abnormalities, smoking, diabetes, someone who has these factors, hypertension needs to be treated more aggressively because they are at an increased risk. Just wanted to make you aware that uh, some of these factors, Dr. Weber will also touch upon heart rate, low birth weight, sedentary lifestyle, uric acid, LPA levels, migration. These are all factors. Dr. Ram was just now talking to me about our study in Ludhiana. We have seen within the first three years, those migrant labor from UP and Bihar who come here, they don't actually have the same prevalence of hypertension. But beyond three years, actually, they start having the same prevalence of hypertension as we have in Punjab. So conceptually, this is the, the latest, the last month released ESC guidelines. I don't want to bother you too much, but risk modifiers are being talked of uh, along with actually the risk scoring that you make because of the established risk factors, hypertension mediated organ damage and established disease. So preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, autoimmune diseases, all these will actually place your, individual, your patient into higher risk along with uh, early picking up of left ventricular hypertrophy, album, uh, albuminuria, proteinuria, or fundus examination that we conventionally do. The last phase of these target organ damages, of course, someone has had a stroke, MI, heart failure, CKD. These are, uh, uh, as we say, the patients who are at highest risk. Uh, coming to management, I'll just uh, touch a little bit upon this. Uh, 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 Sirish was talking about the WHO mission to reduce salt. We know India is one of the highest consumers as, uh, as we consume very high levels of salt. There was an ICMR study which showed we consume 9 to 11 grams of salt. Whereas, and this our Indian guidelines have actually emphasized that pickles, papad, chutney, anything that contains baking powder, Anything food that is preserved is very high in salt. And the, some of these diets like peas, onions, potatoes, wheat are low in salt. So we have given according to our Indian diet as to what our lifestyle methods should be to prevent. This is American guidelines. Dr. Weber will talk of actually will tell us how the, 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 the thinking has changed since 2017. But this is the first line agents they gave. And this is what we have. Uh, in younger people, we since they have a high renin hypertension, we treat with A, that is ACE inhibitors or receptor blockers. But we have kept B within brackets because there are selective patients in which we have to, I don't want to talk on this because this is the major part of our uh, uh, seminar today. Older people, you would like to treat them with calcium channel blockers and diuretics. We today talk of combination therapy rather than monotherapy. And in fact, the International Society of Hypertension Guidelines and even the ESC guidelines now say you start with low dose of two agents rather than starting with one agent. And as you know, step three is A, C, and D and the resistant hypertension, how you uh, further go on. So this is just to show that uh, the stepped care approach is now giving way to combination therapy. The targets that Americans have given is beautiful, 130 by 80, anything below that you should achieve. The European guidelines have even suggested that don't go below, below 120 by 70, which I think is a very good um, uh, guideline to give. And we in the Indian guidelines have actually for elderly, we say a little bit more moderation, younger people, higher risk people, you try to achieve uh, coronary artery disease like you. So this is, an, uh, this is a range approach that we have given in our Indian guidelines. The WHO uh, is working hard on this. And uh, lots of patients have actually been, Dr. Ram was talking before this, that how to increase adherence and Sirish was also saying. So this is simplistic protocol that has been given for Indian uh, physicians and Lodipine, Talmisartan, combination, then Chlorthalidon. This is the American actually, uh, the hearts, WHO, simplistic. They say you combine with Talmisartan and Lodipine as a combination and then you increase their dosages. Uh, well, this August physician uh, uh, gathering actually knows uh, very well about this. But uh, the Japanese were looking at the ESH guidelines, what impact they made. Yes, out of hospital blood pressure is a lesson for us. We need to use home blood pressure more often. It's been shown recently that morning dose, bedtime, something that we used to debate a lot, has similar outcomes. We now treat, of course, hypertension in a personalized manner. 
And of course, in please, in improving hypertension control with other methods is becomes a very important issue because we would like to involve, since we all know only 10% of our population in India, uh, this uh, last year's report actually showed are, are controlled and almost one third are aware that they have hypertension. So we need to do a lot of work in this area. Uh, although the Lancet Regional Health uh, Survey last year showed that uh, the hypertension control rates over the last 20 years have increased from something like 15% to 22%, but still we are far away uh, from the ideal situation. Of course, greater task sharing, extended prescription periods, more involvement of staff nurses, telemedicine, these are all going to improve actually uh, the persistence or adherence of our patients. And today, the latest, 20, the, the ESC guidelines also are talking of how to improve adherence because this is an issue which is bothering everyone. We all as physicians know how to treat hypertension, but where we lack, I would say, as a clinician is in proper recording of the blood pressure and in making sure that our patients adhere to hypertension. When the global... Mm, when the American guidelines were released, actually, we, Dr. Ram was asked to write an editorial on global impact of these uh, guidelines. And uh, uh, he took me along and we actually uh, published this editorial in circulation. I'll just put one line, one important factor that we emphasize, hypertension screening and diagnosis programs on a massive scale, something that we have now the uh, the India Hypertension Control Initiative by the ICMR is trying to do. So we have to first detect a larger number of people. There, in 2018, when the ESC guidelines, ESS guidelines were released, again Dr. Ram was invited for an editorial in a European Heart Journal, and in this we did emphasize that protocol-driven standardization of treatment regimens, so that our patients uniformly get similar treatment, are important. Uh, this year, actually, again, when the ESC guidelines, uh, Dr. Ram put this title, no need for a QR code. And we did emphasize that it is an opportunity to improve public health by way of early diagnosis, effective treatment of hypertension. And I would like to end here. I know you are all very eagerly looking forward to Dr. Michael Weber's talk on uh, how best we should treat our patients with hypertension. Thank you. Dr. Michael Weber, over to you, sir. A voice not coming. You're on mute. We can't unmute, huh? Michael, you are muted. Can you unmute? Uh, our technical team, digital team, can you unmute? Or to use it, it's. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Very good, very good. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> every time I, I speak at uh, events like this, uh, the biggest adventure is actually making my slides come up and uh, getting myself heard. And with a lot of help from my friends uh, in India, uh, it, it is uh, a real pleasure to be able to be uh, talking to you uh, today, and uh, particularly to be working with Professor Wander and uh, Professor Ram, two uh, uh, esteemed colleagues uh, with whom I've worked on many occasions in the past, uh, and uh, uh, with uh, Venkata Ram, a, a good personal friend. Uh, we have been fighting these battles for more years than we would care to admit. And uh, I'm going to be talking on uh, beta blockers today, uh, something that's uh, very close uh, to my heart because uh, uh, going back several years, I did my uh, PhD uh, work on uh, uh, understanding uh, how beta blockers worked on hypertension 
and particularly their effects on sympathetic activity and particularly uh, their effects on the renin angiotensin system. That was a long time ago at a time when beta blockers were still not sure uh, that they belonged in the treatment of hypertension. All right, now I've run into my next technical problem, which is advancing the slide. Let me try it again. Okay. There is, as Professor Wan has already pointed out, worldwide, not just India, everywhere, urgent need to improve the treatment of hypertension and to uh, increase the number of patients who get appropriate treatment. In the United States, things are not good. And what is disturbing, if just look at the left side of this slide, uh, you, you can see that uh, over the years, from roughly 2000 to about 2012, 2013, the number of people getting controlled was increasing. And we're very happy about that. But then in about 2013, it started to decline again. Fewer people were getting control. Things weren't improving, they were getting worse. And this was before COVID, so we can't blame COVID for this. And it's a function, on, I'm afraid, of the fact that too many of our doctors who treat hypertension, who for the most part are general practitioners, primary care physicians, are so busy with so little time for their patients that hypertension is not getting the attention that it deserves. And we're going to have to find new strategies uh, and some of the ideas that Professor Wanda put forward about having nurses and other health professionals get involved in caring for hypertension, it, it, that is going to be very important. Uh, we saw the data from India, and indeed, uh, only a small percentage of people have the blood pressure controlled, and it's worse in rural centers out in the countryside as compared with the city. Not surprising because it's more difficult for people who live away from population centers to get good regular treatment. Now, all the guidelines, as Professor Wanda just pointed out, the American guidelines, European guidelines, and the Indian guidelines emphasize the value of strict blood pressure control and all really have now come to agree that the target systolic blood pressure should be less than 130, and the diastolic should be as close to 80 as possible. Uh, and they also say if it's not tolerated, if uh, patients can't handle getting the blood pressure reduced too much, do the best you can. You don't have to always get down to a, less than 130. Just do what you can. I do want to show one meta-analysis that was actually commissioned by my colleagues who wrote the guidelines in the United States, the American uh, College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines. They thought that less than 130 should be the target for everybody, uh, but they didn't want to make that decision alone. And so they actually commissioned this meta-analysis by an outside group of statisticians and epidemiologists based on 19 studies to see whether in fact the, the worldwide data on the treatment of hypertension would support less than 130. And indeed here we see a significant reduction in major cardiovascular outcomes, strokes, heart attacks, and so forth, when you get down to less than 130. So that is very important to know. This is not just an idea that someone had. It is based on solid data. This is just to remind me to say, uh, a moment ago, remember I, I pointed out, sometimes we can't always get blood pressure down as much as we'd like. This is just making the point that if all you can do is get it down by uh, five or better, 10 millimeters mercury, you're not down to 130 yet, but at least you've reduced the blood pressure, let's say by 10 millimeters of mercury, you see anywhere from a 20 to close to 30% reduction in major events, strokes, heart failure, and so forth. Be better if you could make the pressure lower, but any reduction at all is helpful and worth fighting for. 
Now, the new uh, European guidelines came from the European Society of Cardiology. And somehow, and perhaps sadly, the European Society of Hypertension and the European Society of Cardiology have are no longer working together on this. It's a shame because it's basically the same people who should have been involved for both of them anyway. But the uh, uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines were just uh, put out uh, two or three weeks ago in London uh, at uh, uh, the, the big uh, ESC meetings there. And they now recommend that systolic pressure be treated to 120 to 129, not just less than 130, but perhaps getting down somewhere into the 120s. That is exciting and important. Beta blockers are now restored to first-line treatment. Some of you may recall that some of the guidelines around the world have been a little bit cautious with beta blockers, saying, well, maybe not everyone should be getting a beta blocker. Uh, it now turns out that particularly with the newer generation of beta blockers, they fit in very well. And we'll talk about that in just a second. And so it's good to know now that the guidelines have restored beta blockers to full first-line therapy. Uh, they do make the point that if people, uh, and, and Dr. Wanda made this point too, that individuals who have trouble with treatment, maybe they have orthostatic hypertension or they get dizziness or uh, they're frail and people aged over 85, yes, uh, I think you can be a little less aggressive. All I know is I see patients, many of them are in the 80s, and you know something? They handle Pressure's down to 130 very well indeed. Not all of them, but most of them. And the payoff is enormous. The SPRINT tri trial ta taught us a number of years ago now that even older people, people in their 80s, do very well with aggressive treatment just as long as they can tolerate it. Okay. Now, Again, I just wanted to show you this slide. This is from the European Society of Hypertension people. It's the same story that you've already heard, and Professor Wan has already discussed this, but I just wanted to, again, blow up uh, on the uh, right side of the slide here the statement that beta blockers are back in town, so to speak. They can be used as monotherapy for treating hypertension, and they can fit into any kind of combination therapy that you might wish to offer. So when should we now be thinking about beta blockers? Well, we all know that the sympathetic nervous system plays a big part in the causation of high blood pressure. And so many of the drugs we use, in fact, work one way or another in uh, attacking the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, now, this is a slide uh, to which, uh, for which I'm indebted to my... Uh, a friend and colleague, Venkata Ram, uh, and it, it makes a very nice point. If we look at this series of arrows in the middle of the slide going from left to right, uh, that is showing the increasing activity of the sympathetic nervous system as we move from pre-hypertension to established hypertension to more severe hypertension to complicated hypertension to resistant hypertension. The more hypertensive, the more difficult the patient, the more is the role of the sympathetic nervous system and more is the importance of treating it. So that is a good place to start in understanding where beta blockers are eventually going to fit in, as we'll come to in just a second. These are very nice data, again, uh, looking at heart rate, uh, now, heart rate is a very simple way of measuring the sympathetic nervous system. It's not really accurate, and, and some of the specialists in the field, some of the researchers will say, don't oversimplify things. But I like to oversimplify things because we're all pragmatic people. We all are uh, practitioners who see patients. And someone with a high heart rate probably has increased sympathetic activity, and we should be thinking drugs that work against sympathetic activity. And this just shows uh, that uh, if you look at uh, just heart rate, uh, it's a strong indicator of uh, people who are uh, uh, at an increased risk. We see too that uh, 
people who have high heart rates have increased uh, uh, levels of uh, sympathetic nerve activity as measured by a single muscle sympathetic nerves. It's a, it's a, it's a somewhat complicated technique. Uh, and we also see that it's reflected the high heart rate by increased levels of nor epinephrine, uh, also uh, increased levels of epinephrine or adrenaline, as you probably call it in India. So that's important because just from a simple everyday point of view, people with high heart rate don't do so well. And sure enough, in the Framingham Heart Study, people with higher heart rates had higher levels of cardiovascular events. Very, very simple. If it's good to be less than 65 with your heart rate in the 60s to 70s, not too bad. Once you get into the 70s, into the 80s, things get worse. And once you get uh, higher than that, uh, you really have to start worrying. This happens often in young people with hypertension, but it can happen at any age. And again, what are we going to do about it? Well, there are different ways you can attack a high heart rate. Um, in the middle, we show beta blockers. And that's the obvious thing. I think every one of you is now thinking, well, it's like, hey, why is he worrying about this? If someone's got high heart rate, yes, they need to get a beta blocker. But just to, be, um, to mention, there are other ways. Some people who, for whatever reason, don't tolerate beta blockers. On the left, we make the point that the non-dihydropyridine calcium blockers like verapamil diltiazem, they can be useful for slowing the heart rate. And for people uh, with uh, heart disease where it's important to get uh, the uh, heart rate down, ivrabidine is also a way of doing it. But let's focus on beta blockers because that is going to be the approach we use in well over 90% of our patients. Now, let's look at the benefits of beta blockers. And uh, on the left, we show some of the uh, attributes of beta blockers that we believe make them very well worthy of consideration for treating hypertension. They uh, uh, work well. They reduce heart rate. They reduce blood pressure. There is plenty of evidence that they reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, particularly in people who have evidence for coronary disease. But even people who have risk factors for coronary disease, we, you could be thinking, huh, maybe a beta blocker is where we want to go. And they can uh, contribute to just basically reducing sympathetic activity and reducing risk. Now, beyond that, there are some patients with hypertension who absolutely must get a beta blocker if they have angina pectoris. Obviously, that's going to be your choice, not just for the, hyper, for, for the angina pectoris, but for the hypertension. It makes sense to use a drug that's going to work for both situations. Likewise, heart failure. Anyone who's already had a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, should be on a beta blocker. P people... Uh, who have increased heart rate should be on a beta blocker. And I think that is now recognized uh, by the uh, guidelines of people that beta blockers are so important. Cardio selectivity is an important attribute of beta blockers. And it's particularly important in those many patients who have asthma, in other words, airway disease, or who are smokers and all, all, again have a compromise of their airways or of other causes of obstructive lung disease. And uh, bisoprolol, uh, which uh, is uh, a drug now well recognized and used in India, is a highly cardio selective so called beta 1 blocker. That's an important attribute for beta blockers. And this just shows uh, that uh, bisoprolol, in fact, is probably more beta-1 selective, in other words, more protective of the lungs than just about any other agent. Now, we see other uh, beta-1 selective blockers, such as betaxolol, atanolol, metoprolol, and yes, they are beta-1 select beta selective to a reasonable extent, but not as much as by soprolol. And if we look at the ratio of uh, beta 
one to a beta two to beta one, or putting it the other way around, beta one to beta two, we see that bisoprolol is actually superior to uh, the other kinds of uh, beta blockers. Some of them are reasonable. There's nothing wrong with metoprolol uh, in that setting, but best of all, from that po- from this point of view of cardio selectivity, is uh, bisoprolol. In fact, here is a, a study uh, looking at uh, look at the top part of this uh, slide. Uh, we're looking at airway resistance uh, over time. And we see in a pl- people treated with placebo, nothing happens. Good. We don't expect it to happen. Here in the middle, and this these red dots, that's bisoprolol. Again, no change in airway resistance. That's very good. That's very exciting. And here on the right is atenolol, which is perhaps the most uh, well-known of the beta blockers. Uh, I'm actually pleased in a way it's being replaced by others because it's not quite as good as the others. And you can see that there is, even though it's supposedly cardiac selective, we see that there is an increase in airway resistance when you use atanolol. Clearly in this setting, bisoprolol would be preferred. And uh, here again, a study in patients who had asthma, quite common uh, in India, uh, and with the uh, pollution we have in the air in all countries these days, uh, this kind of airway problem is an issue. And we can see that bisoprolol has no effect on airway resistance uh, when it's used for treating patients who have asthma. Okay. So what about hypertension itself? Does bisoprolol reduce blood pressure? Well, (laughs) we know it does. And uh, Here is a look at 24-hour blood pressure uh, tracings. Uh, If we look at systolic blood pressure shown in red, that dotted line is the baseline, and then the solid line uh, is the uh, uh, treatment value. We see a very nice fall of somewhere between 15 and 20 millimeters of mercury uh, in some part, times of day, even better than that, in systolic pressure and similarly big reductions in diastolic blood pressure. It's no question that throughout the 24 hours of, 24 hours of the day, uh, bisoprolol is having a really good effect on blood pressure. And here, the same sort of data, but now looking at a comparison, bisoprolol in red and atenolol in yellow, And if we look on the left side of the slide, which looks at systolic blood pressure throughout the day, reductions with bisoprolol are consistently better than with atenol, about five, six millimeters of mercury better, which uh, if you want a translation, that means about a 10 to 12% better reduction in the likelihood of having strokes, heart attacks, heart failure, and other major events. So it is a meaningful difference in cardiovascular outcomes. Does it work as well, bisoprolol, as other kinds of drugs? Well, here's a comparison against losartan, amlodipine, hydrochlorothiazide, and the answer is yes. Bisoprolol in this particular study seemed to do somewhat better than the other drugs. I'm not being negative about the other drugs. They are all very good drugs. Bisoprolol, though, is a genuinely effective reducer of blood pressure. And uh, just for people who worry about are there adverse effects, because remember, some of the original old-fashioned beta blockers going back 40 years or more uh, were known to have uh, adverse effects on glucose and, and were not good drugs to use in people with diabetes. Uh, here we see that is not an issue at all. And uh, uh, the use of bisoprolol, really, it shows that it is just as well tolerated as ACE inhibitors and other uh, kinds of drugs. It is very, very safe. It does not adversely affect any of the parameters of glucose metabolism in people with diabetes. Now, you already heard from uh, Dr. Wanda, biggest problem in treating hypertension, 
people don't take their medicines. So why not simplify it by doing it the treatment with one tablet a day. In other words, put two, if necessarily three medicines in one pill a day makes life a lot simpler and easier for patients. And that is what all the guidelines now strongly recommend, combination therapy in a single pill. Uh, and we know this is work from Dr. Gupta, uh, which is uh, one of the real standard uh, studies, one of the most quoted studies in the whole field of patient adherence. And he's the one who's pointed out significant improvement in people getting the medicines into themselves if they can do it with one pill rather than having to take two or three pills separately. Very important study, very important lesson. And here's another important lesson. Uh, and that is sometimes you start a patient on one drug and then it, you're not getting a good result. Should you double the dose of that drug or would you be better off acting, adding a second drug? Well, just look at the uh, columns on the left to start with. Uh, that's, this happens to be people on a, on a diuretic, I think. Uh, if all you do is double the dose, yeah, you get a bit of an improvement, maybe like two or three millimeters of mercury, if you add a second drug, you get a far bigger improvement. And the lesson from this is you are always better using a combination, even in a modest dose, than using a single drug in a high dose. And all the guidelines now say you don't have to go to the top doses, but use reasonable doses in combinations and if possible, in single pill combinations. Uh, the, it's a strong, well-supported lesson. Well, what about the combination of drugs? And what about an unusual combination in a sense, a beta blocker plus an angiotensin receptor blocker? Now, I happen to be very fond of both of these drugs. Telmasartan is a valuable con contributor to treatment because it's got a long duration of action. And it also has been demonstrated to reduce cardiovascular outcomes. Just very quickly, um, here is a look uh, using ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, a uh, study by Dr. La Coutier, uh from Canada. And if we look on the left, we see that Telmasartan reduced blood pressure, ambulatory blood pressure, uh, systolic, during the first six hours of the day by roughly 18 over 12. And then you go to the last four hours of the day, just before the next dose is about to be taken, and guess what? The blood pressure is still down by about 18, 19 over about 12. So it works consistently. It doesn't lose any of its efficacy throughout the 24 hours. And that's so important because the early morning hours before people typically take their medicines are very dangerous times. So many people will have strokes and heart attacks in the early morning, even before they get out of bed or just as they get out of bed. And so a drug that really works for 24 hours is so important. And here's another study with Thomas Sartan just showing that for the same amount of blood pressure reduction as with other therapies, it is associated with a significant reduction in cardiovascular and endpoints, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or stroke, the so-called Transcend study. I was a part of that, uh, and it was a very successful study. This is just uh, to make the point, and this is work from uh, uh, Dr. Wander, I believe, uh, a, a recent publication. Uh, what we're looking at is a uh, comparison of telmasartan with metoprolol in that's shown in blue and telmasartan combined with bisoprolol shown in the brown color. So if you look at the seated systolic blood pressure, we see that there is a bigger response, uh, 28 millimeters of mercury reduction with that uh, combination with the uh, uh, bisoprolol combination with telmasartan versus about 24.5 with the metoprolol. That's a very useful difference in blood pressure. 
And uh, this is um, uh, the, the trend uh, with using telmasartan and uh, these beta blockers over time, showing a very nice reductions in blood pressure, particularly so with the combination of telmasartan and bisoprolol. And uh, there is a significant difference, actually, between the two groups. Bisoprolol and telmasartan is significantly superior to metoprolol and telmasartan in reducing the systolic blood pressure. So important information, uh, work, working equally well, by the way, in younger and older patients. And the tolerability of this treatment, again, this is still from the study by Dr. Wanda. So thank you, sir, for <laughs> allowing me to use it. Uh, we see excellent uh, tolerability. Patients uh, enjoy taking this treatment. It is the same as taking uh, a placebo. It's, it's got no adverse effects at all. So just one last thing as I finish up. We now know that guidelines call for single pill combinations. And some patients, uh, in fact, quite a few patients will need three drug single pill combinations. And there are now two very interesting three drug products in development. And of course, uh, it's our friends uh, at uh, Microlabs who are responsible for this, bisoprolol plus telmasartan, which we just talked about, but now adding amlodipine or as an alternative, bisoprolol plus telmasartan again, now adding chlorthalidone. I think these will be very welcomed uh, products for people who need just a little bit more power to get their blood pressure under control. So in summary, again, guidelines now recommend treating systolic pressure to less than 130. Core adherence is the major problem we all deal with. Guidelines strongly recommend, all of the guidelines, the use of single pill combinations. They also recognize that beta blockers must now be integrated fully into hypertension therapy. They are back. They are fully equal to any of the other drug classes. And finally, bisoprolol is a beta blocker with strong blood pressure and heart rate lowering properties. It's cardioselective, therefore it's particularly safe and its uh, combination with telmasartan, which is a very innovative product, uh, works very well and is very well tolerated. So let me stop there and uh, uh, hand over to uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Ram. Thank you, Michael and uh, Dr. Wander. Uh, my task is going to be actually very simple and straightforward. I am going to show only two slides, which will set the theme for uh, for the discussion. So let me share the screen. I hope you can uh, see the screen. Uh, World Heart Day is tomorrow. So we're having a discussion on the eve of the World Heart Day. As uh, people in public health know, uh, World Heart Federation has designated uh, September 29th of every year uh, to recognize the importance of uh, heart disease and how we have to prevent it by proactive steps. Uh, and each year, the theme uh, has been very similar in the last three, four years. And uh, the, the theme this year is the same as last year and will be the same next year, is use heart for action. Very, very simple. It says use heart for action. By action, what uh, World Heart Federation means is that uh, people who are engaged in public health, cardiovascular disease, prevention of disease, you should try to impact the people who make policies 
on healthcare delivery and how to change the behavior of the patients and how to make them also more responsible for their own care. Dr. Wander mm -hmm. is nodding his head because he talked about uh, adherence uh, earlier on and uh, he should be happy to know as a former, he's a former president of the Indian uh, Hypertension Society of India and the Indian Society of Hypertension. Uh, Indian Society of Hypertension is a signatory to the recent European Parliament document on uh, adherence. So India is a signatory to the document which has been approved by the World Medical Association and World uh, Health, Health Organization. So important contribution from India as a signatory to adherence. So this year theme is using heart for action at the individual level, at the societal level, at the community level, at the national level, so that you reduce the disease burden on our country. As uh, all of we know that the heart disease is a major contributor for premature morbidity and mortality around the world. The last statistics global are year from year 2020, 20 million deaths annually are attributable to heart disease. So that is almost a million and a half every month. 20 million cardiovascular deaths per year annually in 2020. And according to World Health Organization, 50% of this cardiovascular disease burden unfortunately comes from South Asia, namely India. So ladies and gentlemen, two important things to keep in mind today and always is a large number of people are uh, suffering from heart disease and having premature death. And uh, for at least for the participants in this program, India sadly is a contributor to this uh, fact. And we need to reverse it with, uh, according to the theme, namely use heart for action. Now this program that uh, we are talking about, today's program, uh, let me see. Uh, it's an important medical education program, as it was uh, pointed out by Dr. Manjula and as well as Sirish, uh, an evening program that greater awareness of uh, medical education as a tool. Charles Mayo, who is the, actually the founder, one of the founders of the Mayo Clinic, in 1927, in 1927, he said that two objects of medical education, to heal the sick, and to advance medical science. So both of these functions we should do through platforms like this. And the importance of medical science has already been nicely elucidated by both the speakers on uh, how the medical science has advanced in terms of the guidelines, therapeutic choices, etc. And Dr. Uh, Wander has actually given a proper perspective of various guidelines on how they have evolved in order to restore good blood pressure control across the board in the community. And Dr. Weber has pointed out uh, sympathetic nervous system as an important denominator in the elevation of blood pressure and in the causation of cardiovascular disease. Various aspects of sympathetic nervous system, and he has covered a few of them, how they can actually cause a significant aberration in cardiovascular function and cardiovascular structure. And once cardiovascular structure is affected by cardiovascular dysfunction, then the disease occurs with progression, sometimes an inexorable progression to end-stage heart disease, end-stage kidney disease, stroke, etc. Dr. Weber has uh, pointed out that uh, despite various, uh, what do you call that, weathering effects of dynamic changes, beta blockers have remained very resilient. Uh, they have been very resilient despite so many dynamic changes that have happened. And a uh, lot of trends uh, that we see in medicine, they're like ebb and flow. They come and go, ebbs and flow, but the truths of science will always be there. And the truth of science uh, should be applied and uh, they should never go away. So that is the importance of uh, medical science. 
as a contributor towards public health through forums like this. So I'll stop sharing the screen now. Then uh, if somebody could tell me, I don't see anything in the chat box. Is somebody is going to do voice or going to send me anything? Could you, uh, unless uh, Gurpreet or Michael, do you see anything in the chat box? I don't see. I've not yet seen. No. Okay, uh, Sirish or Manjula, could you alert us if there is anything to be done? Uh, I know Harish. Uh, is... Good evening, Harish Murthy here. Yes. So, uh, since uh, there are no questions in the chat box as well, and we have a panel discussion at every location after this, and so uh, individually, the panelists will take up the questions based on the discussions we have had here. That's how uh, we will go about it. So, Harish, could you tell us what would be what would be our uh, input if it is required, or would we be observers, or uh, 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 certainly we don't want to be interceptors? Uh, uh, you know, uh, what will happen is, sir, now we will have live discussions in all the uh, fifty-five locations, right? So, we will be stopping the live streaming. And individually, we have moderators and panelists in each of these locations who will take ah. the discussion forward. So what about uh, we just uh, listen or uh, uh, observe? What yes, sir. Uh, you can you can log off. We will send you a link which is live on YouTube, and there you can look at what is happening. Right. So, can is it fair then to say that uh, the the formal didactic responsibilities that uh, Dr. Weber and Dr. Wander had that has concluded. Yeah, sir, uh, yes. we can have few questions if there are any from the Bangalore hub here. So if I would request if any doctor has a question here for the esteemed faculty, uh, you may make, please come up. Can we hand over the mics, please? If anybody has a question. So Harish, as they're doing it, uh, once that is taking place, Dr. Weber and Dr. Wander, do they sign off from the Zoom uh, or do they have to, if they're interested, they can rejoin the proceedings as observer. Am I right? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, we yes. we, will, we can question. take these few questions here and after that, we can sign off, sir. Uh, uh -huh. We can sign off, but... Uh, if they're interested, then you'll send them a YouTube link if they can see yes, what it yes. is. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, sir. I am Dr. Pradeep Kumar from Bangalore. Uh, I have a question. Uh, sympathetic overactivity is definitely real. It's uh, widely known in many of our young hypertensives, especially in India. But recognizing it is definitely an issue. So other than an increased heart rate or a persistent heart rate, there was one study which found that there is about 63% is the prevalence of sympathetic overactivity in newly diagnosed uh, hypertensives. But what other parameters, objectively or subjectively, we can consider to diagnose this sympathetic overactivity, apart from increased heart rate? Thank you. <laughs> So, Michael, what uh, what uh, is implying uh, is uh, heart rate uh, is uh, straightforward if you measure it. Uh, a lot of times we don't, unless patient says he has palpitations. Uh, is there uh, any other parameter? Uh, I, I nothing. The biochemically mm -hmm. non no. easy to do, and sympathetic uh, nerve activity is only experimental and not a tool for diagnosis of sympathetic overactivity. Michael? No, they, yeah, no you're absolutely right, uh, Venkata. Um, yeah, heart rate is useful, and particularly in the young men, a fast heart rate uh, is, is really very indicative of sympathetic overactivity and responds very well to treatment with uh, beta blockers. Uh, other than that, uh, as, as you pointed out, uh, and it's a great question, uh, probably 60, 70, maybe uh, more percent of, of hypertension is, to some extent at least, uh, regulated by sympathetic overactivity. Um, and clinically, it's not easy to measure. We, we can't measure plasma concentrations of adrenaline, noradrenaline, all that sort of thing. 
what uh, we have to do, though, is we have to assume that sympathetic overactivity is going on. And if we find that our treatment is not uh, uh, being as effective as it should be, we should be asking ourselves, should we be focusing more on sympathetic blocking drugs? Do we have a beta blocker in place? Because that may work where other drugs don't work. Uh, and there are other drugs that block sympathetic activity as well. The centrally acting drugs, not as well tolerated as beta blockers, but they are very useful, for instance. So uh, you know, I, I'm glad you brought that question up, uh, because apart from heart rate, we just have to assume that when someone is not doing well with their treatment, sympathetic activity may be the explanation, and we should make sure we've got that covered in our choice of drugs. Thank you. Uh, Gurpreet, you... Can you briefly comment? I know you'll supplant what Dr. Weber has said. You participated in that India heart study where you have demonstrated increased heart rate uh, in a large number of people. So don't you think the heart rate itself is a reasonable surrogate marker? We don't have to look for anything else. Good point, sir, you brought up because the India heart study was truly a large study with about 18,000 individuals. And what one of the inferences of this study, besides the ones I shared, Indians had higher heart rates by about eight or 10 beats per minute uh, as compared to other races. So this, uh, some people believe it could be a marker of physical deconditioning. Some people uh, believe it could be uh, inherent to our syndrome X. But yes, in that study, and even otherwise, it has been shown that our heart rates are uh, higher than others. And a lot of, uh, although the guidelines have revisited beta blockers now, but I have been party to many, many, uh, I mean, such webinars and debates and discussions where Indian physicians always used to say that I like to treat my patients with beta blockers. I would say even in their worst phase when uh, beta blockers uh, after the life study came when atenolol was compared with losartan and people felt that uh, the central blood pressure reduction is less and metabolic factors some of these which are countered now with the availability of such highly selective beta blockers uh, people now know all that uh, issue was more of a drug related rather than a class effect it was a drug effect and uh, as sir said and as dr weber said uh, there aren't very many markers, but yes, if you have a patient who has associated migraine, hands are shivering, tachycardia, comes to your clinic, anxious, you obviously know that this patient has sympathetic activity increased. Yeah, thank you, Gurpreet. <laughs> Dr. Pradeep, it, it's, a, it's a question, uh, important question, but in reality, in clinical practice, uh, heart rate remains probably a, a reasonable surrogate marker of sympathetic activity. Other than this, getting plasma catecholamines will not help. In fact, it will confuse. No. Because they, they go up and down all the time. And by the way, when you take the blood, the puncture itself increases the sympathetic tone and the catechols <laughs> go up. And that is the reason why in diagnosis of pheochromocytoma, we leave an indwelling catheter for five minutes or so until the pain has gone to draw the catecholamine. So uh, it's not a good marker. It, it's a symbol, but not a good marker. So let us use heart rate for the time being. Uh, it's uh, one comment I have is when we talk about vital signs, we talk about the blood pressure, we talk about the weight, and we talk about strangely respiratory rate, but we don't put heart rate as a vital sign. In fact, the heart rate should be included oh. as a vital sign because it's a vital sign. And that's a, that's pretty good. We don't have to look for anything more, not 100% accurate, but it's a reasonable thing. Remember, uh, lastly, Harish, I'm going to say something and then I'll conclude, is the sympathetic nervous activity Dr. Weber has talked about and Dr. Uh, Wander introduced, uh, the importance of sympathetic activity to human health uh, is associated with three Nobel Prizes in our own lifetime. Julius Axelrod, who noted sympathetic nervous system changes cardiovascular function. James Black, who found out how to block the sympathetic nervous system. And uh, the, the, tri the trio of Murad, uh, Ignaro, and Fushgart 
they found out the vasodilatory aspects of beta blockade with nitric oxide delivery. So this is the only physiological system that I know of where three Nobel Prizes have been associated with science and discovery. So Harish, that yeah. those are, do you Thank have you. any more questions? Yes, yes. Uh, there's, there's one question from Coimbatore. Uh, the doctor wants to know whether beta blockers have a role on central aortic pressure. I think uh, I think some of you, I think uh, Gurpreet commented or Michael, both of you can comment. Please, Gurpreet. Comment. See, uh, there is uh, there is data. Uh, a component of the life study did show that the reduction in central blood pressure was less as compared to the sartan, and that was the time when beta blockers, uh, I mean, uh, were going out of uh, popularity as first line agents. But over a period of time, we have realized the value and the virtues of cardio selective beta blockers. So uh, that is primarily the reason that beta blockers have come out. Initially, there was some fear. Uh, certainly one factor that one should keep in mind, beta blocker, the conventional beta blockers and diuretics uh, as a combination uh, can increase new onset diabetes. So uh, that would not be a very good combination. But otherwise, um, uh, beta blockers are today, as we have seen globally, they have there is a resurgence and we have realized that uh, of course we know beta blockers in heart failure beta blockers uh, in all stages of heart failure are first line agents today the central aortic mm -hmm. bp which is a i mean interesting thing we also do it uh, there are no large number of studies that show a differences in this ascot as a small sub study but not with beta blockers i think it's an interesting concept the drugs that lower the central aortic bp are likely to be better than that which don't. Uh, and it's a given, likely to be better. There's no evidence. And our good friend, uh, I'll take his name, it doesn't matter, trans uh, always touches on controversies or creates controversies. Uh, he always says that uh, the reason for the previous negative outcomes with older beta blockers is because they increase the central aortic BP uh, that has been uh, his hypothesis. And I think he and Sripal Bangalore published something, a uh, meta-analysis uh, in uh, Jack or something. Yes. Yeah, you're right, Venkata. But uh, uh, I think the modern beta blockers that we are now prescribing, by so and so forth, that is not an issue. Uh, but this, it's a very interesting question. Uh, but I know uh, we have distinguished colleagues in uh, 55 centers around India who uh, are waiting to uh, deal with questions at their own sites. Uh, so let, let me say that for me, it's certainly been a pleasure uh, working with you, Venkata, and with Professor Wanda uh, today. And uh, uh, it's a very exciting session. And I, to all of you, uh, I, please enjoy your, your local sessions with the distinguished faculty who have been assembled there. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wander and Dr. Ram. In fact, it has been a pleasure to have such a privileged faculty today with us. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. And I'm sure a lot of good take-home points uh, for all the doctors sitting across 55 locations. So thank you so much. And with this, we close the live streaming. And I would request all the moderators and panelists at all the centers uh, to start their panel discussion and take the meeting forward. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you.